الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم بخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم سورة النحل of the Quran and Allah سبحانه وتعالى says and we have sent down the book يعني the Quran sent it down on thee O Muhammad صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم sent it down that this book might explain all things Sent it down that this book might explain all things. Tibiyanan likulli shay. And so when you want an explanation for anything, whether it be politics, or monetary economics, or trade and development, or banking, whether it be psychology or sociology, or astrophysics, Whatever the branch of knowledge that you seek to study, it is with this Quran that you must begin your studies. And it is with this Quran that you must end your studies. All through your study, let the Quran be with you because this Quran explains all things. It is also the word of Allah and it is eternally protected. It cannot be corrupted. And so it is absolute truth. It cannot be challenged. No one can challenge it. 1400 years have passed and none have succeeded in challenging it. None. And so it is when the Quran has spoken that you know this is unquestionably the truth. And the Quran tells us speaks to us of someone called the Messiah. And our topic today is not just on the Messiah, Al-Masih, but on his return. And so we begin by asking, who or what is the Messiah? And the word Masih is familiar to us because you have to make wudu if you want to perform salat. And you know when you make wudu, you don't wash your head, do you? No, you make mas. <laughs> you touch your head, you rub your head. So, masih is one who is touched. And they use another word, they say that we use oil, so they call him anointed. <laughs> so, al-masih, he's known as al-masih. Because he is constantly touched. By whom is he touched? This person who is known as Al-Masih. And the Quran declares, بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ That he is constantly touched at all times by the Holy Spirit. But in Britain, you know, they have strange terminology. The British, they don't say spirit, they say ghost. <laughs> so it becomes the Holy Ghost instead of the Holy Spirit. And when we ask, who is this Holy Spirit, Ruh al Qudus, who is constantly touching the mercy, in consequence of which he's not a normal human being, no? He is capable of doing things that no one else can do because he is constantly touched by the Ruh al Qudus. The Quran answers the question and he says that it is the Ruh al Qudus who brings down the Quran on you, O Muhammad. And who it is who brings down the Quran? The Quran answers and says it is the angel Jibra'il alayhi salam. So now we have that the Ruh al-Qudus brings it down and it is Jibra'il who brings it down. 
So the Jib Jibra'il alayhi salam is the Ruhul Qudus or what they call the Holy Ghost. And he is the archangel. And an angel always acts on the basis of instructions from Allah. An angel does not have any free will or self-directed will. An angel cannot choose to go on this road or take that road. No. An angel, وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ Whatever they are ordered, they do it. So everything that this angel does, he does it on the basis of instructions from Allah. And then the Quran tells us that Maryam السلام, receives a visitor. And the visitor is the Holy Spirit, but he has come in the form of a human being. And he, di he discloses to her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained that she will give birth to a baby boy, but she's not yet married. She's only about maybe 14 years of age, so it is illegal for her to marry. Illegal, according to, you know, Dajjal, Dajjal law. Dajjal says you've got to be 18 before you can marry. <laughs> Wait on Judgment Day. <laughs> so, the angel says to her, not only are you going to have a baby boy, but your baby boy will be the Messiah. So she knows, she knows who is the baby boy who is going to be born. And she knows the story that all Jews know about. Not just a story, it's part of their history that Allah Most High had made a promise to them because they suffered great trauma. It must have been extremely traumatic for them. When Nabi Dawood was appointed as Khalifa on earth, Ya Dawood, Ya Dawood, Inna ja'allaka khalifatan fil ard. David, alayhi salam is appointed as Khalifa to rule on earth and to rule on the basis of the truth which has come from Allah. And so this is the first Khilafa state and they are proud and happy to be part and parcel of this Khilafa state and they are called Banu Israel a people who have descended not just from Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam but from his son Nabi Ishaq alayhi salam the prophet Isaac and from his son Nabi Yaqub alayhi salam the prophet Jacob and then for reasons we don't have time to disclose to you tonight the name is changed from Jacob to Israel and they're henceforth now known as the house of Israel, Banu Israel. And they're very happy because they now live in a Khilafah state. And then with his son Suleiman alayhi salam, the Prophet Solomon, I have to translate because we may have some friends at present in the gathering who may not know the terminology. And sometimes we have others who are not friends. Eh? <laughs> so, we have to translate. And with Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, the Prophet Solomon, that holy Khilafah state, they call it holy Israel, becomes the ruling state in the world. And this was the golden age. But that golden age ended abruptly, suddenly, as soon as Solomon died and that of course we have explained in in this book on um, uh, on Dajjal yes this book explains why did that Khilafah state die when Solomon died alayhi salam connected with the subject of Dajjal so there was trauma there was hurt there was pain in their hearts that we had it for only a brief moment 
and then it was lost. And then Allah gave this promise which brought soothing to their heart that I'm going to send to you one who will bring back that golden age. Oh yes, this must have made them weep with joy and that he would be known as the Messiah. So every Israelite knew about the Messiah and so this girl who's just 40 Oh, she knows the subject very well. Then the time has now come when the Lord God is going to fulfill his promise. And the golden age is going to come back. And the Messiah will come to restore the Khilafah state, the holy state of Israel, the Khilafah state, because he is Khalifa. And we're going to rule the world one more time. Not as an imperial power, not with oppressing others. We will rule the world one more time because it is divinely ordained. But when Allah sent the Messiah, He sent the Messiah in a very strange way. He sent the Messiah to test them with the mother of all tests because they had been misbehaving in the meantime. For example, they've been changing the word of Allah, making halal what Allah had made haram and so on. So he sent the Messiah as the son of a virgin girl. She's a virgin and she gives birth to a baby. She parted from them and no one knew that she was pregnant. And when the baby was to be born, she is now in such terrible pain. And she's all by herself, all alone, and this is the first time she's experienced it. It must have been a terrifying experience. And that's why she's raised above all the women of the world. All the women of the world. This is the highest of all. And her name is Maryam, or Mary, or Marie. And when the baby was to be born, the pain was such that she said, I wish I were dead. I wish I were dead. I wish I was nothing. And then a voice spoke to her from beneath. And the voice said to her, There's a palm tree with date palms. Eat. There's a river running with water. Refresh yourself. And on this day when I am born, you must take a vow of silence. If anyone comes to you, tell them I have taken a vow of silence and I will not speak to anyone on this day when the baby is born. So when the baby was born, she returned to her, her town, to her people. And when they spoke to her, Maryam, how come you're not yet married? How come you have a baby? Because she has taken the vow of silence and the voice beneath her could speak because he is strengthened by the Holy Spirit, an unborn baby is able to speak, a baby who has not as yet been born can speak, but of course the Ahmadiyya movement led by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad they have their own version of truth. It came somewhere from Hollywood, I believe. And the strange thing about the Ahmadiyya movement, you can talk and talk and talk and talk. They never listen to you. The baby is able to speak even more, even though the baby is not yet born. Why? Is it so difficult to understand? that this baby is strengthened by the Holy Spirit and hence this miracle can take place. But they don't teach that at universities. They only concerned with secularized knowledge. So now, because the baby has instructed her, be silent, don't speak. It's part of the divine plan to test them. When they ask her, Maryam, what what explanation do you have for this? Your father was not a bad man. Your mother was not an evil woman. How can you have a baby you're not yet married? 
If she was married, would they ask that question? Answer me, Ahmadiyya. If she was married and she had a husband, would they ask that question? <laughs> ah, yes. But she does not answer them. Why? Because she has taken a vow of silence. Allah has ordered it. And that vow of silence is applicable today. Not for six months or six years. Today, meaning the day that the baby was born. Indicating that when she arrived at her people, she had arrived with a newborn baby. Not a six-year-old that Muhammad Asad pulled out of a rabbit's hat. Muhammad Asad, yes. I speak respectfully of him because he was a great scholar. I pray that Allah might bless him, Muhammad Asad, and that Allah might forgive him for the mountain of a mistake he has made in his commentary and translation of the Quran. Yes, I hope it was by accident and not by design. Yes. It had to be a newborn baby when she came with the baby to her people. Why? Where is the proof? Because she is still under the vow of silence. That's why. And the vow is applicable for today, the day of her birth, of the birth of the baby. So this is a newborn baby in the cradle. And Allah spoke about that newborn baby. And he says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, this, this newborn baby is going to do two things. Listen to what the newborn baby is going to do. Wa iskal Allahu ya Isa ibn Maryam, uzkuru ni'amati alayka wa ala walidika, walidika, is ayyaduka biruh al-Qudus, biruh al-Qudus. O Jesus, remember the the blessings I conferred on you and on your mother when I strengthened you with the Holy Spirit in consequence of which to kallimunnas to kallimunnas fil mahdi wa kahlan that you will speak from the cradle hence a newborn baby born today you will not understand why I am why I'm laboring this so much until you go and study what this they've written I don't want to mention their names and their views have gone far and wide and they've brainwashed the whole african-american Muslim community the whole african-american Muslim community has swallowed this rubbish and this lecture will reach them, inshallah, I hope. You will speak to the people as a baby in your cradle. And that has to be a miracle. I don't know about London, but babies normally don't speak from the cradle. Huh? I don't know about London because London is a strange place. New, newborn babies don't speak from the cradle. If a newborn baby speaks from the cradle and there are people around to witness it and to confirm that this, this did happen, then that qualifies as a miracle. Okay, but the Quran went on to say something more. Remember, this is Surah Al-Ma'idah. To nasa fil mahdi wa kahlan. Twice. Twice you will speak. Twice you will speak. The first time is as a baby in the cradle, and the second time is an ad as an adult. Oh, but uh, even in London, adults speak. There's nothing big, nothing miraculous about that. That's normal. If you're an adult and you don't speak, you're dumb. But if you're an adult and you're not dumb, then it's normal for an adult to speak. So then where is the need for the Ruhul Qudus? Answer, the, the Quran is saying 
that you will speak miraculously twice. You will speak miraculously as a baby in the cradle and you will speak miraculously again as an adult. Come on, put on your thinking caps. It is normal for an adult to speak. How can an adult speak miraculously? Give me your answer, Ahmadiyya. Our answer is the only way you can explain this baby speaking miraculously as an adult is if he leaves the world and comes back to speak again. There is no other explanation because we will learn later in this lecture that they tried to crucify him. And guess what happened after that event? The event where they attempted to crucify him and then they boasted we have crucified him. Immediately, immediately with this event, the Quran shuts the chapter. The chapter on Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the Messiah, is shut. There is nothing, nothing, nothing again in the Quran about him. He disappears. So then it has to be miraculously before he was attempted to crucify. But there's nothing so far. From the time he became an adult to the moment when they attempted to crucify him, there is nothing miraculous. Speaking miraculously in the cradle as an adult, the first one, yes, we saw it. Where is the second one? Our answer, Ahmadiyya, and our answer, my dear learned brother Muhammad Asad, may Allah have mercy on your soul, is that here is the proof, one of several proofs. The Quran is telling you by implication that speaking miraculously as an adult has not as yet taken place. And speaking miraculously as an adult implies that the chapter is not yet over, that there's more to come. And the only way there can be more to come is if he comes back to this world. And so the Quran is affirming that he will return, the Messiah will return. So when they heard the baby speaking, they said, that's pure magic. And they cast this slur on her and they blamed her for fornication. And therefore they declared that this baby is a bastard. And so later on they could never accept that a bastard could be the Messiah. Allah tested them and they failed the test. They were looking only at the Zahir, the external. And they failed to look with their internal sight to understand that this was a test from Allah. When Nabi Isa Islam was about six years of age and he's committing, he's, he's acting, performing miracles, taking mud and shaping it in the form of birds and uh, breathing into them and by Allah's leave they become living birds and they fly away. This became a tremendous embarrassment for the establishment. His life is in danger, so his mother had to take him away. And he disappears until he returns as an adult. And when he returned as an adult, oh, he blasted them. At the time of Christmas, we only hear about the lamb. We never hear about the lion. I wonder why. The lion went into the temple and found them engaged in riba, ripping off the people, changing the Roman money to temple money and ripping off the people with riba. And the lion cursed them. And the lion turned over their tables and 
chased them out of the temple. And the lion said, you've taken the house of God and transformed it into a den of thieves. And the lion said, I am the Messiah. And they held the kangaroo caught and they said, this man must die. They threw rubbish on him and on his mother. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared in the Quran that this was kufr. For example, he says, wa bi kufrihim wa qawlihim ala maryama buhtanan azimah. They threw rubbish at him. And Allah says this was kufr. And they decided that he must die and he must die by hanging. Because the Torah says that whosoever dies by hanging is the cursed of the Lord God. So they demanded of the Roman government to crucify him. And when they saw him die before their very eyes, it was now confirmed beyond the shadow of a doubt. He could not have been the Messiah. Why? Number one, he never established the Khilafah state, Christoid, which had disappeared when Suleiman died. We never ruled the world. The, girl, the golden age never came back. And he is dead. And number two, look at how he died by crucifixion. So it is proven now, beyond the shadow of a doubt, he could not have been the Messiah. And if you and I were present at that moment, we also would have declared he's dead. He was crucified. Why? Why? Because Allah says in the Quran, Walakin lahum. It was made to appear, meaning Allah did it. Allah made it appear that he was crucified. Well then, what happened? We do not have to go to CNN to get the explanation. Why? Because the Quran says that it explains all things. So there must be an explanation in the Quran, not in Kashmir, for what happened. What does the Quran say? How did Allah make it appear to them that he was crucified? The Quran says, number one, Wama kataluhu, they did not succeed in killing him. Okay, then what happened? The Quran says, number two, وَمَا صَلَبُهُ They did not succeed in crucifying him. Oh, but we saw him crucified. The Quran says, number three, وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ Allah made it appear that that was what happened. He was crucified. Okay. The Quran says something more. It says that Allah took his soul, not his bed, not his hat on his head. Allah took his soul. Ya Isa, Surah to Ali Imran. Ya Isa, O oh, Jesus, inni mutawafiq. I am going to take your soul. It doesn't say I'm going to take all the dirhams in your pocket. It doesn't say I'm going to take your coat. It says I'm going to cause you to experience wafat. And in this context, in this context, wafat is to take the soul. Don't you have something called Salatul Janazah in, in London? Do you have it? Oh good, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Salatul Janazah for our friends is a funeral prayer. And in the funeral prayer do we make a dua? Yes. And in the 
in the dua, don't we say that we, if, what is the dua? Allahumma fil li hayyina wa mayyitina wa shahidina wa ghaibina wa sagilina wa kabirina wa zakari wa unsana. Allahumma man ahyaytahu minna fahihi ala al-Islam. Now listen. Now listen. Wa man tawafaytahu minna. Here's the same word, wafat. Fatawaffahu. Same word, wafat. Ala al-Iman. Those who's those whom you cause to die, those whom you cause to die because you are taking their souls, grant that you may take their souls in a state of Iman. So the context of wafat is in the context of taking the soul. That's the context. Not the money exchange, not the supermarket. Ya Isa, I'm going to take your soul. Well then, if Allah takes the soul, what happens after that? Let the Quran answer. There are only two possibilities, not three. Forget Kashmir. Only two. What are the two? If Allah takes your soul, then either this or that, nothing else. Surah to Zumar gives the answer. And Surah to Zumar says this or that. If Allah takes the soul, then either this or that. There is no third possibility. But the Quran says Allah took his soul. So now we have to ask, was it this or that? You realize I have to take my time. I have to labor the point. Because there's a massive brainwashing which has taken place. Massive brainwashing and even scholars of Islam were brainwashed. Yes. But thank Allah for the Quran. That the Quran is Al-Furqan. <laughs> With the Quran you can distinguish that which is brainwashing from what is the truth. Allahu yatawaffal anfusahina mawtiha. Allah takes the souls. Same word, wafat. When the time of death or mouth occurs. Wallati lam tamud fi manamiha. And those who do not experience death while they are awake, Allah takes their souls while they are asleep. For yumsikullati qada alayha al mawt. When Allah takes the soul, then it's either this or that, no third possibility. Either he keeps the soul, which case you are dead, or he can return the soul, in which case you did not die. Where did this come from, CNN? This came from the Quran. So when Allah says, Ya Isa, O oh Jesus, Inni mutawafiq, I will take your soul. Don't play games with the Quran, I warn you. Don't play games with the Quran. Be careful with the book of Allah because you have to stand up on judgment day. If you misquote the Quran or you explain the Quran the wrong way, be careful with the book of Allah. This is the miracle. Oh Jesus, I will take your soul. That is what Allah said, number four. Number one is, they did not kill him. Number two is, they did not crucify him. Number three is, but Allah made it appear to them that he was killed or crucified. Number four is Allah says, I will take your soul. If Allah took his soul and did not return it, well, he is dead. He is dead. But the Quran says they did not kill him. That leaves us with only one left. Only one answer is left. 
as unpalatable it as may be to the Ahmadiyya movement and as unpalatable as may be to those who've been brainwashed by a theory of substitution that came either from Disneyland or Hollywood, I don't know where it came from. Either Allah took his soul and kept it, in, case, in which case he is dead, but that could not be the answer because Allah said they did not kill him. Well then what is left? Allah took his soul and returned it. That is the only possibility. Is there a third possibility? Let me stand up and ask you, is there a third possibility? There are only two. Don't fish for a third one out of some rabbit's hat. There are only two possibilities. Once Allah says, I took your soul. Be careful with the Quran. Don't play games with the Quran. Allah says, I took your soul. He didn't say, I took your wallet. He didn't say, I took your, your winter coat. He says, I took your soul. And so the implication is, I can cool down now. I can cool down now. Because those who've been brainwashed have been given a little shaking up now. The brainwashing has been so great that even the world of Islamic scholarship was brainwashed. That's why I had to speak so loudly. You will forgive me. Allah took his soul and Allah returned it. But when he returned it, they didn't see it. They didn't know it. <laughs> they didn't know it. And then the Quran says, number five, I raised him unto me. So the soul was returned when they could not see it. And they did not know it. And then Allah raised him, so he did not die. He did not die. How can a physical human being be raised into the Samawat? They ask the question. And our response is, the material body has evolved from spiritual substance. We have a spiritual body and it has the same shape, same shape as the material body. The companion of the Prophet was killed on the battlefield in the battle of Uhud. And then the companion saw the Prophet looking up in the sky and saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. When they looked up in the sky, they saw nothing. So when the battle was over, they asked, O Messenger of Allah, what was it? Subhanallah in the sky. He said, your companion who got married yesterday, and we allowed him to spend the night with his wife, and who joined us today, and as he jumped into the battle, he was killed. I saw the angels giving him ghusl in the sky. But we don't know why the angels are doing that. But at the same time that there was a body in the sky being given ghusl, there was another body lying on the battlefield. And they had the same shape. This one was the material body and that one was the spiritual body. And the spiritual body emerged through a passageway to become material form. It was a transformation for the spiritual body to emerge in material form. And if you reverse that process, the material body will become once again the spiritual body. And this is how Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam performed the Mi'raj. Yes, the material substance transforms itself into the spiritual, the same body, that one in the sky, being, being given the ghusl, <laughs> and this one lying on the ground, same body, but this is material, and that is spiritual. So Allah raised him unto himself, so he did not die. And the Quran declares, Kullu nafsin za'ikatul maut. Every soul must taste maut, including the Messiah. And so here is the second proof from the Quran that the Messiah will return. He has to come back. But then Allah gave a very powerful statement in the Quran, which is today coming to pass.
before our very eyes. In the same verse in which he said, in Surah to Ali Imran, Ya Isa, inni mutawafik, O Jesus, I'm going to take your soul. Warafiyuka ilayya, and I'm going to raise you unto myself. At that moment, Allah disclosed something more because he is watching and seeing what they have done with his Nabi. So he, declo he disclosed at that time something more. What did he disclose? He says, They threw the garbage on you and your mother, but I will cleanse you of that garbage. I will cleanse you of those who did this act of kufr on you. Cleanse you. Wash you clean. Not only that. <laughs> Not only am I going to cleanse you of this rubbish that the, these acts of kufr have done unto you, but something more. You want to hear it? وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ We have a scholar of Islam here as our chairman today, mashallah. Imam Muhammad Sharif. وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ Those who follow you. Do we follow him? Come on, answer me. When you are asked in the grave, the angel comes and asks, who is your Nabi? Would you say Nabi Isa? No, we don't follow him, do we? No. When the angel asks, who is your Nabi, which one do you follow, we say Nabi Muhammad, not Nabi Isa Islam. So we do not follow him. We follow another Nabi. We follow Nabi Muhammad. We do not follow him. Is that clear? Can we continue? وَجَعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا I love the next words. Oh yes. NATO doesn't like it. <laughs> no. They have the surprise of their life taking place now as I speak after 500 years of bloodshed and oppression and arrogance the Quran is now speaking today and these words of the Quran are coming to pass before our eyes but we would not know it unless we study the Quran وَجَعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ ثُمَّ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ I will cause those who follow my Nabi and since there is only one true deen it's the deen of Islam Whoever follows a Nabi, no matter which Nabi it is, is in the deen of Islam. Is that so difficult to understand? Since there is only one true deen in the deen in the Islam, since there is only one true deen, Whoever follows any Nabi, any Nabi, any Prophet, you are a follower of a Prophet, you are in the Deen of Islam. Is that so difficult to understand? And therefore you are Muslim. So you can be a Muslim and you following this Nabi and you are in the Deen of Islam. And you can be a Muslim and you're following that Nabi and you're in the deen of Islam. Is that so difficult to understand? Is that so difficult to understand? After I don't know how many hundreds of years of brainwashing? Hmm? Now, it's time for the Quran to come and wash our minds.
Yes, and bring back the purity of thought. So I am going to cause, he's speaking to Nabi Isa Islam, to the Messiah. And this is being said to him at that moment when they attempted to crucify him. At that moment, Allah spoke. And he said, not only am I going to raise you, not only am I going to purify you of all that rubbish they've thrown at you, these people who have committed kufr, but also I'm going to raise, raise to a status of power, raise to a status of dominance, raise to a status of honor, raise, raise, raise. I'm going to raise those who follow you to a position higher, dominant position, over those who have committed kufr on you and on your mother. And when that happens, when this side is raised higher than that side, it will continue until the last day. It will continue until the last day. And so those who are following you will continue to follow you until the last day. Is it clear? Has the brainwashing been removed now? That history will end. History will end with those who follow the Messiah being raised to a status of dominance over those who have betrayed him and thrown garbage on him. And when this side is raised to a position of dominance over that side, which is taking place now, and I thank Allah that I have lived long enough to see it. I thank Allah that I have lived long enough to see this prophecy in the Quran being fulfilled before my very eyes. But I can see it because I had a teacher. I had a teacher called Molana, Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari. And he taught me, he taught me how to study the Quran. That's why I can see it. History will end with those who follow the true Messiah when he returns, being raised to a position of dominance over those who have betrayed the true Messiah. And when these are raised in a position of dominance over these, that will continue until when? Until the end of history, until the end of the world. And so they will continue to follow that prophet and not this prophet. Is that so difficult to understand? Is the Quran not plain and clear? They will continue. Those who follow that Messiah, that prophet, will be raised. وَجَعِلُوا الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ They will continue in that state of dominance over these until the end of the world. This is one of the amazing conclusions that come out of this lecture. That history will end not only with the Ummah which follows Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. But history will end with another Ummah. And it will be an Ummah which follows Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Who are they who follow him? <laughs> the Quran answers the question. Nabi Isa alayhi salam was not sent to us. Was he? No. Who was he sent to? Twice in the Quran, it is plain and clear. Number one, Ya Isa, Ya, ya Bani Israel, Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum. O house of Israel, O people of Israel, 
I am the messenger of Allah who was sent to you, not to others, to you, not to others, to you. So he's not sent to us, is he? But <laughs> you don't need to even put on your thinking caps, it's so easy. He was not sent to us, he was sent to them. And then there's the other, Rasulan ila Bani Israel. Hmm? And perhaps there are others as well in the Quran. So Nabi Isa alayhi salam was sent to Banu Israel. But after Nabi Isa alayhi salam came, Banu Israel was broken into two. One part who held on to the book with which he came, which was the Injil, the Gospel, and the other part which rejected him and rejected the Gospel. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the wisest of all, chooses two terms, not one. He chooses to use the term Banu Israel, but he also uses the term Ahlul Kitab, because <laughs> You have these people with a kitab, and that is the Torah. And you have these people with the kitab of the Torah plus the kitab of the Injil, the Gospel. So you have two names now. You have Banu Israel and you have Ahlul Kitab. So Jesus, Nabi Isa Islam, when he comes back, he comes back to the Christians and the Jews. He doesn't come to the Hindus. He doesn't come to the Buddhists and he doesn't come to the Ummah of Muhammad And so when Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, when Imam al-Mahdi said, here he is, here is the Messiah in the Masjid, in Damascus. It was the time of Fajr, the Salat al-Fajr. And we have appointed him as our Khalifa He's our Amir al Mu'minin, and we now have our Khilafah state. Hmm? And he comes down, our Khalifa, our Amir al Mu'minin, the leader of our Ummah, is about to lead the Salat. But when he sees the Messiah, naturally, it's polite. He did the right thing. You can't criticize him for that. He did the right thing. He invited him to lead the Salat. Yes, he did the right thing. But if he had accepted the invitation and led the Salat, what would have been the implications? You understand now? You understand? If he had led the Salat, he would have immediately become Amirul Mu'minin of the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. But did Allah send him to us? No. <laughs> so he said, no, you lead the Salat. The people have appointed you as the Amir al-Mu'minin. You lead the Salat. And he joined in the Salat. And he prayed in the direction of which Qibla? Makkah, of course. But is Makkah the only Qibla valid in the Quran? Is the Kaaba the only Qibla that Allah considers to be valid in the Quran? Does the Quran single out the Kaaba as the only Qibla? And the other Qibla is now Mansukh? Here, read this book. <laughs> Methodology for study the Quran, read this book. No, that Qibla is still valid. Jerusalem. And this Qibla is still valid. Mecca. And Allah says in the Quran, but of course we don't know it because we eat biryani and go home and sleep. <laughs> I'm not bad talking biryani, it's a good dish, huh? <laughs> We don't know it because we're too busy to study the Quran and we prefer to get hand-me-down knowledge. Well, that fellow said it. I heard it somewhere, Sheikh, but I don't know where I heard it. Learned people come and tell me that. I heard it somewhere, Sheikh, but I don't know where I heard it. <laughs> no, the Quran says, that is your Qibla, and this is your Qibla. And you must not follow that Qibla, and they must not follow this Qibla. Go and search in the Quran and you'll find it. So he performs his Salat in the direction of our Qibla. But when he is with his Ummah, and he leads the Salat in accordance with that Sharia, 
Which Qibla will he face? Their Qibla. Now then, we have a problem here. We have a problem here. The problem is, he has to know this Sharia when he comes back. Not only that Sharia from that book, but also he has to know this Sharia from this book. So how will he know it when the Quran is to be revealed 600 years after? That's the question I'm asking you. How will he know that this is their Qibla and this is our Qibla? And this is their way of performing Salat and this is our way of performing Salat. And this is their Sharia and that is our Sharia. And how? Because he's a messenger of Allah, he has to be between both. So he has to know both. Does the Quran tell us how this is going to be done? Let me find something for you. Yes? This is in Surah to Ali Imran. And now you must put on your thinking caps. Where you, this is the angel speaking to Maryam. Alayhi salam. وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْتَوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ You're lucky because this is a public lecture. I can't stop here. You're lucky. Otherwise, I'll stop the lecture now. And I invite you to hear what you have to say. He will teach him, Nabi Isa Islam, Allah will teach him the kitab. And then after that, Allah will teach him hikmah, wisdom. And then after that, Allah will teach him the Torah and the Angel. How do we make sense of this? Answer, on this side, is the Quran. The Kitab, yes, stands to the Quran. And this side here is the Torah and the Injil. On this side here is one Sharia. On that side is another Sharia. On this side is an Ummah. On that side is another Ummah. And if you have to be between them, we not only got to teach you the subject, we got to give you wisdom. Now you understand the Quran? That's why he said that he will teach him the kitab and then give him wisdom and then teach him the Torah and the Injil. Because between this and that, you have a lot of complex issues and you need wisdom. That is why wisdom is placed between this and that. And so this is is yet another verse of the Quran confirming that he will come back. And when he comes back, he will have a knowledge of the Quran and the Sharia of Muhammad Who are those today who can be identified as the people who are following him? And who are those today who can be identified as the rubbish, the people who threw the rubbish on him? My answer to you, is that history is already manifesting and showing you before your eyes that the orthodox Christian world has said never in a thousand years we will never have legislation that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. Get lost! And the orthodox Christian world is saying we will never bend our knee to the oppressor. The oppressor has been oppressing us for 500 years. And they who are oppressing the whole world for 500 years are the ones who threw the rubbish on him. <laughs> and they are the ones in alliance with those who have thrown the rubbish on him. And now we have come to that moment in time when 500 years of oppression are about to end. And Allah is intervening. Who are those who are following him? Which Christians are they who are tru truly following him? Does the Quran tell us anything about them? Yes, it does. And I have quoted the ayah 500,000 times already. <laughs> but they would not listen to me, no. Those who support the bogus jihad in Syria, they will not listen to me. No, 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 no. 
Bashar, he, he raped 500,000 babies and Putin is this and Putin is that. I tell you, they are now behaving. They are now displaying the behavior of a people who are driven to madness by the touch of shaitan. They are displaying the behavior of a people who have been driven to madness by the touch of shaitan because they cannot stand up to the truth which has come from the Quran. No. The truth of the Quran is blasting their falsehood away. The bogus jihad is being blasted away. The truth has come and is dispelling all that garbage. You cannot stand up to the truth. And this is the truth. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَجِدَنَّ أَكْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارًا That the people who will be closest in love and affection to you would be a Christian people who declare we are Christians. And then the Quran continues to describe who those people are. And they are the Orthodox Christians. I have lectured so many times on this. And who are those who have been throwing the garbage on him? And in, a, and a, in alliance with those who have thrown the garbage on him and on his mother? The same Quran tells us, لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء بعدهم أولياء بعد. Do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. This is the correct explanation of the ayah. If you reject this, wait until you're in a grave and you'll see. Yes. Ba'aduhum awliya ubad. So this Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance are the ones on this side with kufr. And the Orthodox Christian world is the one who is following Jesus. And what we are now about to witness is what Allah has prophesied in the Quran. That Allah is going to raise this side to a position of dominance over that side. And that's coming now. That's already shown its, its, its face. And it's coming. This side is led by Russia. Yes. And they are doing everything that they can possibly do to give Russia a bad name. Bad name. Oh yes. They're pulling out every rabbit they could get <laughs> to, the hat, to give Russia a bad name. But Allah is going to intervene and give to this side a position of dominance over them. And when that happens, it will continue until the end of the world. This is the first implication of the return of Jesus, Nabi Isa Islam, that he will come back to lead his people who follow him and they will be dominant in the world. They will have their Khilafah state and it will be the ruling state in the world. Is that so difficult to understand? And we will have our Khilafah state, which is led by Imam al-Mahdi. And I have one more thing to say before I end. What is the relationship between the two? <laughs> Allah speaks in wonderful ways in the Quran, in Surah to saf I think it is. And he says, Ya Bani Israel, Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum. And goes on to say, Wa mubashiran, I've come to give you the good news. Bi Rasulin, of a prophet, of a messenger. Ya'ti min ba'di, who will come after me. Ismuhu Ahmad, and whose name will be Ahmad. Oh, but Allah has spoken in the Quran. And he says, Ma Muhammad illa Rasul. He calls him by the name Muhammad. How many times? Four times in the Quran. Four times. He uses the name Muhammad. So then why are you using the name Ahmad? Can't be by accident. There are no accidents in the Quran. There must be some reason. Why is he using the name Ahmad when Allah uses the name Muhammad? Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi salam. Answer, when there is love, when there is intense love, when there is ishq, you use, you use a secret name. 
You use a special name. Have you never fallen in love? <laughs> you use a secret name for your lover, for your beloved. And so when Nabi Isa Islam comes back, he will never refer to him as Muhammad. No, he will always say Ahmad. Because between these two, there is a bond of love. If these two are, have so much love for each other, the implication is that this Ummah and this Ummah will have a bond of love with each other. So, وَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Woe unto those who are saying, put in this and put in that and put in that and put in that. I have a message for you. You're heading for the garbage bin of history. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless us to love the book, the Quran, to find joy and pleasure in the Quran, and to search in the Quran for that which explains the world today. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka inta samil alim wa tub alina ya mawlana innaka inta tawwab rahim. برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين